Okay. And today we are going to talk about seed saving. So seed saving, some people do it, some people don't do it. A lot of people don't know much about it and why they should or why they shouldn't. Uh, so this is going to be kind of um, an intro to seed saving so you can decide if that's something that you would like to do. There's a lot of reasons why people do it. Um, you know, and it can be done with vegetable seeds, it can be done with flower seeds. Some people do it with heirloom seeds, meaning old timey seeds that uh, perhaps your grandparents had. Um, older varieties would be like those heirlooms that uh, you can now find in higher numbers, a lot of times through special seed catalogs, uh, but a lot of native plant um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, communities, if you will, that societies will also have them as they try to preserve some of the um, integrity of the older varieties or the heritage varieties. Um, so seed saving it, it involves selecting suitable plants that you're going to save and harvest the seed and at the right time and then properly storing them over the winter. That's basically the gist of what seed saving is. But you do need to know some basics of it as to um, like hybrids and you know different cultivars, heirlooms or old timey seeds, what will pass through as a true seed or replicate itself. And so there's gonna be a little bit of genetics in here, but not too much, just enough so that you can kind of understand um, why certain traits might be passed on in certain seeds and why they would not be passed through uh, as a true trait. So without a further ado, let us go on to the next slide. All right, so why would you want to save seeds? Well you can get some savings from saving seeds. If you have a rather large garden, let's say maybe, I don't know, a quarter acre, a half acre, and you have a lot of different things growing out there, you may want to just go ahead and save some seeds so that you don't have a ton of money invested in what you're gonna plant the next year. Another reason, you might want to do some regional adaptation. So most, commercially available seed has been readily selected because it performs fairly well across the entire country, meaning it's not going to be regionally specific to where you are. In our case, that would be the Southeast or Zone 7B. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm on the back end of a cold, so my throat is not real happy. So regional adaptation means that you can save seed from the best performing plants that you've grown on your own land that you've laid your eyes on. So let's say that you, you know, have some really awesome okra and you want to have that same particular variety of okra next year because that these particular plants did so well. So you want to save the seed from that. Um, you can gradually develop varieties that are better adapted to your soil, your climate, and your growing practices. So much like the seed companies do, where they're selecting the best seed uh, that would be good for just general growing conditions across the entire country, you can do the same, but just on a micro level. So basically in your own particular backyard with your own zone, your own weather, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, consistent quality. So um, we'll speak to open pollinated seeds and that'll be discussed a little bit later, um, but large seed suppliers rarely um, rogue out the fields to pull out the inferior off type plants. So the seed that they sell um, may have some off types in it. So if you're doing that in your own backyard, you're not gonna harvest all the seed right? So you're only going to, to select the best of what's out there. So you can one-up the, the seed companies, if you will, by making sure that you're choosing the best seed for what you want for the next year. For the joy of learning. Uh, so some people are really interested in the science of seed saving. Uh, they want to kind of take the gardening to the next level. So we always have, you know, a uh, 
category of master gardeners that, that uh, um, come on some of these presentations. And that's because they're really interested in learning more about different parts of gardening. And seed saving is something that is definitely an art. And um, there's a lot of science to it, a lot of STEM stuff. So it's kind of interesting. And if you're a teacher, you can definitely take some of this and use it in your curriculum because there is a lot of different types of science that kind of goes into this. Um, you might wanna explore some heirloom varieties. So heir heirlooms are great. They usually have wonderful flavor. I'll use Cherokee purple tomatoes as an example. Um, I love Cherokee purple tomatoes. They have a great flavor. They're very tasty. But unfortunately, they are not, uh, they're very susceptible to blights and some other issues that tomatoes have. So in my garden, I have a garden. I'm not able to, to move it around and do any crop rotation or anything. So I have consistent problems with blight in my garden. And I really haven't been able to have any heritage uh, Cherokee purple tomatoes in a really long time, which is kind of sad. Um, so some, if you're lucky and <laughs> you don't start out or you start a new garden where you're able to grow your own seed and you're not just getting you know, plants from the local big box or nursery down the road, you can kind of control what you bring in because you're growing your own seeds. Um, presumably you're doing that with your own, the sterile soil and all of that. Um, influencing crop traits. <clears throat> so again, genetics. Um, Plants' genetic traits or the pools are really rich and diverse. There's a lot of different traits. And this kind of, um, you know, goes back to regional adaptation. You can observe your plants and save your seed from the plants that best meet your needs for the germination, ripening time. Maybe you need something a little earlier. The yield, you want something that yields a little higher. And you might notice this particular plant over here does a good job of that. Uh, specific fruit shape. Uh, we see some things in the grocery store like that. The, there's some ugly fruits and some other funky stuff out there. Flavor. Obviously, we all like flavor. Um, you can get better uh, scent and, and certain things from certain flowers. So again, you know, lots of different traits or characteristics of these things. Uh, storage qualities. Maybe certain seeds store better than others. Uh, better disease resistant. Remember I mentioned heirloom varieties and, and they don't have as good a disease resistant. There is some genetic testing that's going out there with some heirloom varieties to try to keep the better traits that they have, the flavors, the shapes, that kind of thing, and introduce some disease resistance. So that's, you know, obviously going to take a lot of time, but, uh, you know, that would be welcome. All right, so seed varieties. Um, I briefly mentioned open pollinated. So there's two broad categories. Um, open pollinated varieties are developed with the goal of producing an improved variety uh, with important characteristics that would be true to type from one generation to the next, or basically it will carry forward uh, for each generation. It's not gonna be a hybrid, uh, for instance, you know, you can look at some flowers and maybe you have a, a combination. You might have a white and you might have a red. Well, next time you might end up with a pink or a lavender or something like that. You can get a lot of genetic variation <clears throat> when you're messing around with, you know, cross pollination and that kind of thing. So um, what you want to do here is true to type. So you can save the seed of open pollinated varieties. And in the next generation, it will perform about the same as the current generation. So there's uh, a couple different types of open pollinated. There's self pollinated. And this is the easiest uh, type of, of um, seed to save. And so that would be peas, beans, tomato seed, uh, peppers, any type of pepper. Um, and then you'll have cross-pollinated and cross-pollinated, you'll have to kind of isolate that. So that would be like brassicas, um, you know, a lot of the stuff you would grow in the winter, corn, carrots, beets, squash, cucumbers, and melons. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
So the other uh, type that you would be looking at would be F1 hybrids. So the offspring of a cross between two parent varieties or the seeds of an F1 won't actually um, breed true. So this is kind of a multi-step process. Just a second. <clears throat> So the first step is to kind of develop some inbred lines. So these are populations that are developed with um, a good bit of uniformity between the individual plants. Um, the next, you'd have two inbred lines that are then crossed and that resulting seeds, that, that's uh, the seed of that resultant cross is then sold as an F1 hybrid seed. Uh, the F1 refers to the first filial, filial generation. So try not to get lost in the weeds of the genetics of it all. Um, but saving seed from an F1 hybrid variety is not a true to type, meaning that these seeds are not going to grow into plants that are identical to uh, the F1 hybrids. The next generation or the F2, which that would be the second generation seed, will segregate into individuals with lots of different traits. So the downside is that <clears throat> saved seed will not perform nearly as well as the original F1 hybrid seed. Um, but you can save the seed from the F1 plants and it will be true to type, but it, um, F1 seed does have lots of advantages. So you know, what you'll get is something that most, and this carries over into the animal kingdom as well as, as seeds, and that's hybrid vigor. That means that it performs better than the parents that contributed to the F1 population. So you'll get a, usually a higher yield. Um, you might get better performance from one individual to the next. One place that I can you're probably all kind of scratching your head and going, you completely lost me. Uh, so if you've ever gone out and picked strawberries at a you pick farm, this is probably the easiest and, uh, demonstration of uh, an F1 generation I, I can use. So in Georgia, we have a lot of disease issues and it's just, it just is, we have really humid weather and we have a lot of rain and it tends to be fairly warm. And so those all kind of combine to form just a, a breeding ground for disease. So we all like to pick strawberries and you know we can certainly grow those here, but strawberries are really susceptible to a lot of different fungal diseases. And so the way commercial operations typically will grow strawberries and if you've ever grown them, then you know you, you typically have a parent plant and then you'll have babies. And if you live in a climate that allows you to uh, kind of just kind of let them grow as they will, those babies will come off the parent plant and those will root. Those are your F1s. So the, the traditional way of growing them, you would just allow that bed to get larger and larger, and then you would go harvest your strawberries. And um, you often would see bigger strawberries, bigger, more robust and healthier strawberries off those babies. So what the commercial industry does here in Georgia, because we have so many disease issues, is they typically will harvest those F1 or those, those babies that come off, similar to like a, a spider plant also, and then they will plant them in the fall of the year. They'll let them grow all winter long. They'll allow them to produce their crop in the spring. And then in June, July, usually June, July up in the mountains, when they're done producing for the year, they spray them and kill them. And many people think that this is a real waste, but honestly, the hybrid vigor or the ability to grow and make bigger strawberries, bigger, juicier, larger strawberries is really part of that genetic F1 cross because as that generation then grows to a, an adult plant and it sends out babies of its own and that um, original adult plant dies back, a lot of that hybrid vigor is lost. So because the strawberries are gonna get smaller and smaller over time, it's not as usable to try to spray them and continue to control the, any fungal issues that they have. So to a commercial operator, it's easier to kill them out, 
start over from scratch the next fall um, because it's a, a, a cost benefit analysis thing. Farming is, you know, very scientific. So that kind of gives you an idea. If you've ever gone out and picked strawberries before, you'll see a lot of those berries are very large and they're, they're very juicy and, and they're what you think of when you think of a strawberry. But if you allow it to continue to send out new babies and new babies and new babies, you end up with strawberries that are very small, um, different traits than what the parent plant was, that kind of thing. So that's probably a, a good example um, but F1 seed, kind of flipping back to, um, you know, more of the vegetables, like uh, trying to think of anything else that I, uh, nothing comes to mind. But F1 seed is generally more expensive than um, open pollinated seed, um, but the increased vigor, I, I guess, can make it worthwhile. And you'll notice that when you do get a packet of seeds that is an F1, it'll be marked hybrid or F1 so that you know that's the case. All right, plant selection. <clears throat> so um, unlike self-pollinating plants, cross-pollinating plants, uh, that means that you have a separate male and a female, um, like brassicas, corn, carrots, beets, squash, cucumbers, and melons, must receive pollen either through wind or insects, from other plants of the same variety in order to produce the viable true to type seed that you're gonna save. So you have to have some type of isolation of those plants, that's very important. Um, and what that means is that the cross pollinating, those seed crops need to be isolated from varieties of the same species. So if you have a couple different varieties of squash or a couple different varieties of carrots or corn, um, you need to make sure that you're isolating each of those varieties so that the seed that you're getting is, is going to be true to type. Uh, <clears throat> the simplest solution is really is to just grow one variety. Um, you know, if you have a really large garden, then you can try isolating from one side to the other. Uh, but generally only choosing one variety of squash, one variety of cucumbers, so on and so forth, um, that can give you your isolation right there. Um, so you can save seeds from one or two plants, but uh, if you can remember back to, I would just say even high school genetics, the larger the population, and that goes for animals, that goes for seeds for your plants too. The larger the population, the healthier the, the population will be genetic wise uh, or the stronger um, it will be uh, genetic wise. So they really recommend that about 20 plants is where you, you kind of start if you're going to save seeds. Um, and that's the recommended number for self-pollination self-pollinators. Um, but really, <clears throat> it's going to be different for each type of, of plant that you're growing. So it's going to be different for squash, it's going to be different for corn, carrots, so on and so forth. Um, so let's say for squash, it might be 50 to 100 plants. Um, but for corn, it's as high as 200. So really, you're talking in order to get a good quality seed, you almost have to have like an acre or so of, of space in order to grow all of this. So, um, you know, it may make sense that uh, you want to be a farmer. Who knows? <laughs> um, okay, so three types of fruits and seeds. So you have fleshy fruits, and that's going to be like your tomatoes, your berries, your figs, that kind of thing. And then your dry fruits, and that's going to be grains and um, grasses, that kind of thing. The fruit wall is going to become part of the seed. And then seed pods or dried pods uh, for flowers, um, you know, some other types like, uh, you know, radish, uh, radish seeds. So those have to be kind of extracted from the seed pod. Uh, with the fleshy fruits, they usually have a pulp that kind of surrounds it. At, pretty obvious with tomatoes and the seeds will need to be extracted and usually um, processed before they can be used. And when I mean processed, 
I mean the fermentation process. So many of you may have come in here thinking, oh, I'm just going to go, you know, snap this pod off of this particular flower stalk or, um, you know, grab some chilies that I left on the plant here. We're going to have a hard freeze. Uh, so I'm going to go grab some of that and bring it in and dry it. And I'll be able to plant my seed next year. <clears throat> and that is the case with some, but not all. So for instance, with, I had mentioned um, tomatoes, some seeds actually require a fermentation process to remove germinating in, uh, germination inhibiting substances from the seed coat. Who knew, right? Um, you know, maybe you've gone into a gardener's house and you've seen a glass jar sitting there with what looks to be kind of a moldy, seedy mixture or something like that. I've walked into my mom's house and seen that. And, um, back in the day before I knew what the fermentation process was and I'd be like, mom, you need to wash that. That's kind of gross. And, uh, and then she would educate me and say, that's supposed to be there. It's the fermentation process. I'm trying to get the tomato seed. Um, it was just kind of a joke between us, but, um, the fermentation process kind of mimics the natural process that's going to take place as fruits rot or as they pass through the gut of an animal. Uh, so it can also increase germination rates and kills some seedborne pathogens. <clears throat> so um, typically it's going to be required for tomatoes and cucumbers. Those are the two that, excuse me, that we use this process in most often. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that. So with the fermentation process, you're going to... Um, let's say that you want um, cucumbers. So you're going to place the seeds in the pulp in a container, and that's in tomatoes too. You're going to add a little bit of water to that seed pulp mixture and mash it until it's about too thick to stir. So kind of like a really thick tomato sauce. And then you're just going to put it in a warm location. So I mean, if you have an old pickle jar or something like that, you can do that, just put it in there, stick it in a warm location like your kitchen, something ideally is 72 to 86 degrees. Um, and then just kind of, you know, let it sit for a while. You're going to mix it a couple times a day just to aerate it and to help with the fermentation process. And it'll take, you know, up to 72 hours, give or take. And as I'd mentioned before, you might see a little bit of mold on the top of it. Uh, but that's not harmful. You can just kind of mix that back in. And you kind of really want to watch that seed. You want to make sure that it's not sprouting. Um, so you might kind of damage the exterior of it, but sprouting is kind of a sign it's soaked too long and then there's damage. So you're not going to be able to save that seed anymore. Um, but the, what you're ultimately looking for is that gel that kind of goes around that seed you want it to be gone. And that means that the process is done, it's finished. So this is what it looks like. <clears throat> Again, you don't need any special anything really to do this. You're just gonna use an old pickle jar in the case of the, the cucumber on the right, uh, or you can just use a bowl uh, for the tomato seeds. It's kind of gross, but like I said, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you're a gardener, right? So you can, Put it in whatever you want to put it in and um you know it just kind of sometimes you go to my mom's house and there's some sitting over on this shelf and some on that shelf and you know that's all fine uh, so after you've gone through the fermentation process and uh it's ready to go at this point you're going to rinse it so you want to get that pulp that was around that seed you want to rinse that off and Essentially, you just want a, um, not a colander because those are going to have uh, openings that are too big for most seeds. So you're going to need some type of a strainer and some type of pressurized water. So you can do this outside if you want to use a little garden hose um, and you're going to spray that and, and then just your hands and you're just going to sit there and you want to do it fairly gently because you don't want to damage the seed, but you do want to make sure that you get all of that pulp material um, off of the seed. Your end goal is you want to have nice clean seed um, free of any of the pulp or the gel or anything like that. Whoa, we're a little crazy there, aren't we? 
All right, let me uh, backtrack here. <laughs> All right, drying wet seeds. And I'm not a fan of, oops, I'm going to just go back there. So, uh, so drying wet vegetable seeds. So the, the stages you're gonna go through, you're after you get it out of the strainer, you're gonna pat the bottom of that strainer with a cloth towel or paper towel or something like that. <clears throat> and you're just gonna kind of let it absorb that water. Uh, so then kind of let it dry like that for a few hours, let it wick that water out, the moisture out of that seed um, and anything that's left in there. And then you're just gonna spread those seeds on a plastic glass or ceramic plate, not paper plates, not wax paper, those can hold moisture. Uh, you want to use some type of a non-sticking material because there's residuals of that gel and the other stuff that's um, leftovers. And so you don't want that to adhere to that paper plate or that paper towel or even the wax paper. You want a nice slick surface like a plate, ceramic plate or something, so that as it dries, there's nothing for it to stick to. And if there is a little bit left, um, you can easily knock it loose. again. Not a fan of, unless I'm doing that. <laughs> um, general seed drying. Uh, you're going to spread the seeds in a single layer and you want them to dry in a fairly airy dry location. So the best thing to do there is to do it you know, in your kitchen where it's kind of warm in a climate controlled area. You don't want to do it in your garage or your basement where the humidity might be a little higher. Um, you want the general humidity to be between 20 to 40%. So that means in a climate controlled house or something like that. And it takes about two weeks for them to fully dry out. And of course, make sure to label them so you know what they are. Um, it wouldn't be very nice if you had some some squash seeds that you were lovingly drying and you had them laid out and maybe one of your children likes roasted pumpkin seeds and thought that maybe that was what they were and then ate them. So that would be very sad. Uh, so make sure you label them with something so that everybody knows what you're doing and not to touch your seeds. <clears throat> All right, so now let's talk about some individual types of uh, vegetables that you would be using this fermentation process on. So tomatillos, um, I like to eat tomatillo salsa. I don't know why I haven't grown them yet in my garden. I uh, probably just because, you know, I usually toss stuff out there kind of last minute. You get, you get busy, it just doesn't happen. If anybody happens to have any tomatillos that they wanna share next year for my garden, I, I would probably be happy to put a few in there. <clears throat> but tomatillos have very small seeds and the pulp around them is, is actually pretty firm. So they kind of look like tiny little green tomatoes. Um, and it's not easily separated, which means you kind of have to help it along if you want to grow them. So the, the steps that you would use, you would be collecting some ripe tomatillos when the seeds are ready to collect. So you see that in, your, in the top left uh, picture. And when the fruit has kind of filled out that little lantern wrapper, and the paper begins to split and dry at the base, that means that it's ready to be harvested. So you're gonna collect them, you're gonna remove those wrappers, and then you're gonna cut the fruit into wedges and put it into a, a blender. And so probably a food processor would be the best thing here if you have a smaller one uh, versus uh, just a regular old blender, but that would probably work too. Um, <clears throat> The seeds are very small and robust. They're not going to, don't worry that you're gonna, I guess, damage them by putting them in a food processor. It won't, they're very small and they're not gonna be damaged by the blades. So you're just gonna start blending on a very low speed and you'll end up with this kind of, looks like a green smoothie. Don't drink it, I don't, I mean, you probably could, but I wouldn't personally, uh, but that's what you're gonna end up with. It's gonna look like a green smoothie from Smoothie King. And, um, and then you're going to take that slurry and you're gonna put it into a tall container. So if you can, then take a quart jar that will work just fine or a larger pickle jar. 
and you're going to pour that slurry in there and then you're going to add some water and uh, you'll see the seeds. Um, you can see here with the pictures, they'll, they'll actually sink down to the bottom, the viable seed will. So you can see what it looks like and uh, just kind of pour off the green slurry. So you can see in the, the jar there to the left that the all the tissue, um, the other, the, the stuff surrounding the seeds is all floated to the top. So you're probably going to let it sit there for a bit so that it can separate out and the seed will float to the, or sink to the bottom and all the rest of the, the material will float to the top and it'll start to settle out and then you can pour off the stuff from the top and you'll be left with just the seeds at the bottom. Uh, those seeds should be viable uh, for the most part as they're heavier and they settle out. And then you're just going to use that same sieve that you used for like your cucumber or your tomato seeds. And after you go through the process of kind of washing them off, you know, squirt with water, uh, you're going to put them on, kind of spread them out nice and evenly on a glass uh, plate. You can also use a paper plate in this case because there isn't really that gel material that is around this particular type of seed like there is with cucumber or tomato seed. So you can use a plastic type um, plate, well, not paper plate, but um, you can use something like that and or a screen. Uh, so like if you have a leftover screen from screen door or something like that, or where you repaired uh, your screen and porch, you can make a small frame if you would like, and you can spread your seat out on that. And then that guarantees that you have good airflow. Harvesting tomatoes. <clears throat> so with tomatoes, um, you wanna allow the fruit to fully ripen. So it needs to be nice and red. And then you're gonna scoop the seeds and the pulp out, uh, that pulp being the gel that kind of surrounds them before you cook and eat the tomatoes. So you're gonna take the seeds and that gel. And just like you saw in the couple previous slides back, the either put it in a bowl, or if you have a mason jar or something like that, or an old pickle jar, you can put um, the seeds and the gel in the glass jar with some water. You wanna kind of stir, swizzle that around a couple times a day, and that mixture will ferment. Remember, you might see a little bit of mold on the top. That's okay, that's supposed to be there. And after um, a, little, you know, a little bit of time, that those seeds will start to sink to the bottom of that mixture. And so when you begin to notice that, that means that, excuse me. That means that they're basically done. So you can pour off that liquid. Um, and again, going through the same process that I showed you in the previous slides, rinse those seeds off and dry them on a nice uh, ceramic plate a plastic plate, something they're not going to stick to before storing. So peppers. Um, with peppers, you don't have to ferment them. So allow some of them to stay on the plants until they're fully ripe and they start to wrinkle. So I know that's usually not a problem with hot peppers. They seem to be the most prolific at everything. So uh, shouldn't be a problem at all. Just leave a few of them on there harvest them when they're very obvious, obviously red, wrinkled, and dried. And then you're going to remove those seeds from the, pe the peppers and spread them out to dry. So just kind of as an aside here with peppers, a lot of folks like hot peppers and may want to um, consider the genetics here. So that's how a lot of these interesting super hot peppers are uh, crossbred. And that's how we have ghost peppers and, you know, Carolina reapers and, and some of those is folks have crossed hot peppers with each other and then, um, you know, dried them and planted the new peppers. And, uh, you know, we've have some that are just off the scale. I don't even know how you would handle them <laughs> without having problems later, but uh, peppers are fairly easy to save the seed on as you can see. Beans and peas. 
So you wanna allow the pods to ripen on the plants until they're completely dry and starting to turn brown with the seeds that are kind of rattling around inside, so up to a month. Uh, keep in, in mind that this is probably gonna be at the end of your harvest period. Uh, as with any other plant, it doesn't matter if it's flowers or vegetables, that plant's whole purpose of being is to reproduce, to produce fruit, and then to die. Uh, so, well, most of them are. So most vegetable plants, if they are allowed to produce fruit and then a seed pod and you leave that on there, then it's going to slow down in production and eventually it will, will stop. So just kind of keep that in mind. You may want to collect your seed towards the end of the season so that you're able to collect a good bit of crop from those particular plants prior to that. Uh, you want to strip the plant or the pods from the plants and spread them to dry indoors. Again, climate control is important here. Uniform hum humidity is very important, both um, for helping prep them for when you're going to store them and for storing them. So the best place to do that, again, not in your garage, not in your basement, if it's not climate controlled, it's going to be someplace probably on the main floor of your house. And it's just a short period of time. So don't worry about you know, it, it, them taking up too much room. Sometimes people will have, um, you know, like a food dehydrator or something like that that has multiple little shelves built in. Uh, you can certainly do that. That, um, you know, that works just as well. You're going to dry for at least two weeks before shelling. Uh, or you can actually just leave the seeds in the pods until planting time. And then right before you can get them out of the pod, that works too. Harvesting herbs. <clears throat> so um, when harvesting herbs um, and flowers, it, it is very important to clean off as much of the dried flower parts as possible. So the petals and um, some of the smaller leaves, that kind of thing. You want to make sure that you get that out of there um, and don't store it with the the seed itself, as that can alter some of the, the humidity. Uh, so it does reduce disease by removing that and um, possible weed seed that might be in there as well. And this is kind of particularly true for herbs like dill and basil, where seeds um, are really tiny, but they're also enclosed in dried flower parts. So you want to make sure that you clean them up really well and get that, that um, chafe uh, out of there, get it away uh, before you store that seed. So for instance, like with basil, um, you're going to clean the seeds that you're going to remove from the flower by kind of crushing the flower. So you can see here the dried flower stalk from the basil on the far right. And then you're going to crush all that up. And then you're going to pick out the seeds. They're small, but they're pretty obvious little black seeds. So working on a, a bright surface, like a, a white piece of paper so that there's high contrast definitely helps. Harvesting flowers. So <clears throat> with flowers, you don't want a deadhead. Um, you're going to wait for the petals to drop and then expose the seeds. At that point, at that point you want to cut the entire flower. So there's a couple different methods. Uh, your first method would be to get a paper bag. So just a lunch bag and put your, your flower in there and then shake it really hard. You know, uh, get your kids to do this. This would be a good thing for your kids to do. And then you're going to discard the chafe and you're going to pick the seeds from the bottom of the bag. Um, sometimes I've done that. I'll just cut a tiny hole in the bottom of the bag and then I'll have a separate bag underneath and and then sometimes the seeds will go down through that little hole and the chase stays in the bag the first bag and then you know I don't have to worry about it anymore method number two that would be for small to medium sized seeds um, so you can um, spread on a paper towel you're going to spread them out just to excuse me dry paper towel and then you use the tweezers to kind of pick those seeds out. And then you're just gonna discard the chafe or the, the dried plant material. And method number three is for larger and heavier seeds. So you're gonna actually crush that flower in your hand 
and then lightly blow away that chafe or that dried plant material and then you're left with the the seed that's heavier that hopefully should stay in your hand and method number four so this would be for seeds like milkweed that have a lot of fluff associated with them so you're going to kind of take that seed pod and you're going to rub gently and that fluff will separate from the seeds. And then you're gonna remove that chafe or that fluffy stuff. And then you're just left with the seeds. So pretty simple. All right, let's look at what viable versus non-viable seeds. So in case you you're not un, don't understand what viable means, that means that that seed will produce an embryo and a new plant. Non-viable means that it will not. Um, same thing as with a human pregnancy or anything else. So you obviously don't really want the non-viable seed. That's just a waste. So you can see here's a diagram. You have the viable seed, which is larger, and you see some um, of that to the left. And then you see the very tiny, small, non-viable seed that never developed fully. So you, you don't want that you only want the biggest and healthiest seed because that's going to give you uh, your best <clears throat> best bet at replicating the plant for next year. Seed storage. <clears throat> the best ways to store seed is going to be in um, a glass jar with some type of a gasketed lid. So a canning jar works really well for this. You can get um, uh, canning lids, you know, they're meant to be sealed, but they work quite well for seed storage. That works well. Um, they also make, I call them flip top jars. They're, they're glass jars. But they actually have a rubber gasket around. There's a little hinge and it flips back and, and you can add or take out. You can do coffee. Uh, or sugar or anything like that that you're trying to keep moisture out of, that kind of thing. That works really well. And you can get those at, you know, any home goods type store. For small quantities of seeds, you can put them in a paper envelope, and then you can put those in a jar. And when I say paper, you don't want to, you can buy very small plastic seed envelopes. Um, sometimes we'll give out seed at events that we're doing, and they might be in a plastic envelope, like what you would use for crafting or something. It's only temporary. It's not meant to be stored for long term in that. That's something that you're going to take home and plant immediately, that you're not going to store, you know, for a, a season or more, um, because that retains moisture, whereas that paper allows for that moisture to, uh, to dissipate. You wanna make sure that you're labeling each envelope and container very clearly so that you can tell what type of and variety of plant you're, de you're dealing with there. What, what's that seed from? You wanna put the date of harvest on there. Uh, germination rates are a thing. And you do see that, um, you know, it does, start to trend down over time. So you wanna know how old that seed is and how long it's been sitting there before you go and use it. If you have a choice of using something from last year versus two years ago, um, definitely wanna use, use up what you can, but you may wanna supplement with some that you'd collected more recently. <clears throat> uh, and a good rule of thumb kind of for determining storage conditions is that the sum of the temperature, so degrees Fahrenheit, so if your house is 70 degrees and relative humidity expressed as a percentage shouldn't uh, exceed 100. So seeds stored at 45 degrees Fahrenheit shouldn't be exposed to relative humidity greater than 55%. Most of us have little weather systems that we purchase that kind of tell us the interior temperature and humidity in our houses. So that should be pretty easy to determine um, if it's going to exceed 100. So obviously, the higher the temperature in the house, lower the humidity needs to be, that kind of thing. Um, that's basically the rule of thumb for seed storage. So ultimately, the key is uh, to successful long-term seed storage is keeping your seeds cool, dark, and dry. So if you store your seeds where the air is moist or wet, they're gonna sprout 
or they're going to get mildew and you've just wasted all that hard work that you uh, put into trying to save all your seeds. So you can actually put them in your refrigerator. I do store my seeds in my refrigerator. Um, you know, you don't have to put them in the freezer. Some people have done that. Just put them in the refrigerator. Your refrigerator is a nice, even temperature all the time with a particular humidity. So you can't get much easier than that. They don't take up a whole lot of space. So you can put some airtight containers. If you have a lot of seed, put one of those ball jars with a gasket and lid in there, or, you know, the envelopes, those, you know, you can put those in there. Um, but ideally you wanna keep um, your humidities or your dryness level of those seed to somewhere between five to 7%. And um, that's probably why we see that they have uh, some of those seed storage facilities that are very far remote where they're looking at, um, you know, a nuclear apocalypse, uh, you know, where you'd have that seed library, they keep them at much lower temperatures and uh, that helps keep the um, kind of them in stasis so you can store them much longer. But we don't really have those conditions available to us here. So we just have to kind of make do with what we got. So good is in a cool, dry, dark place, like a closet or a cupboard, better in your fridge and best you know, a couple degrees below zero, or sorry, below freezing, 32 degrees. But again, we probably don't have that at our disposal. So we just have to uh, make do with what we got, which is probably the fridge. <clears throat> problems with stored seeds. So you're going to have temperature and moisture, moisture problems. So you can get some fluctuation. And this is, can cause... Uh, a loss of viability. So that means that your germination rate might drop and it can cause a loss of vigor. So those seedlings, even if they germinate, may be kind of sickly looking and, and not grow really well. And it can even cause seed de death. So um, you wanna be careful about that. And high temperatures will dry the seeds out and they might damage the embryo. So you do need some um, humidity, that's important. So, but you just don't want too much of it moisture fluctuation. Um, you can consider using a silica packet. You get this stuff all the time in, gosh, your shoes. If you buy a new pair of shoes, it'll have that in there. Save them. Uh, I have them in on all my cabinets because my children love to put dishes away when they're still wet. <laughs> so you know what happens in your cabinets if, um, you put wet dishes away too long, you start getting a mildew smell. So I threw a bunch of those in there. They work really well for all sorts of things. <clears throat> so if after drying, you see <clears throat> mold or mildew on seeds, moisture on the inside of the container, um, you definitely want to use some type of a desiccant because you're going to have those seeds are not going to be long for your garden. They're just not going to work. Um, so making sure that your seeds are, are fairly well dried first and that you're storing them in a good location, much like I mentioned before, your fridge or your cabinet, that kind of thing. And then keep an eye on them by looking at them periodically. Uh, your seeds will be fine. More problems? Bugs. So <clears throat> most people are going to have some type of pantry pests in your kitchen. It's just a given. Um, there's, they're just out there. You're going to have pantry moths or something else. So what do you do? Um, well, you don't want them to infest your seeds. And if they're in some type of an envelope, that's a bad thing. They're easy to get to. So um, seeds kept in a frozen storage are safe from that, pretty obviously. Uh, insects might survive freezing. There are some that can survive freezing, believe it or not, <clears throat> although they're pretty inactive while frozen. So you might also consider adding diatomaceous earth or DE to, pre to prevent infestation in jars, excuse me, 
So you want to cover the surface of the, the uh, seeds to prevent infestation, and that will help uh, if you end up with larva or something else that somehow manages to get in there. Uh, their soft bodies will be cut by that diatomaceous earth, which is basically fossilized um, diatoms from long, long ago, ground up into this very sharp powder that is deadly for soft-bodied insects and mollusks. And <clears throat> then you have animal pests also, raccoons, mice, birds, other animals, and um, you want to make sure that they're stored in tightly closed containers. Uh, I don't know too many people that have raccoons in their pantry, but not to say that can't happen. Uh, storage tips and explanation. So light, heat, moisture, obviously enemies of your seeds. Uh, longevity increases as storage temperature decreases. So if you're cooler with a lower humidity, you will be better off. A dried seed pod, seed or pod will shatter when bent or hammered. Plastic bags and container are not the best moisture barriers. Refrigerator is too humid for seeds in open containers, paper bags or plastic bags. So again, use consider using some type of a glass container with a gasketed lid to, um, unless it's for, this is for longer storage, uh, gasketed lid to, to kind of moderate the humidity change. You wanna keep it nice and stable inside that glass container. Um, you don't put seeds in the freezer until they're very dry because ice crystals, um, they don't form the same way in a seed that they do in the fruit, uh, a, a, a more pulpy fruit. So you don't want to damage the seed. And always let refrigerated seeds warm to room temperature before opening the container. And here's kind of a little cheat sheet for germination rates and how long uh, the seeds will keep. So you can see beans, three years, beets, about the same, somewhere between three and five years. I don't see anything on here that really, sweet corn is two. Parsnips, one, so not very long there. So just be wary of that, that if you're growing some of these, <clears throat> that you might want to use them rather quickly because um, the seeds won't keep as long. Um, some stay, as I'd mentioned, some stay viable for longer, like pepper seeds. They tend to maintain good germination rates for about four years. But, um, but yeah, this is not something that you're going to want to store for a decade. Uh, this is something that you're going to want to use relatively quickly. So germination testing, are my seeds still alive? Well, that's a good question. So relatively easy test to do. Place about 25 seeds on a wet paper towel. And then you're going to put it in a plastic bag that has a small hole for ventilation and put it at about 75 degrees. So that's going to be about the same, about what it would be inside, maybe a few degrees less. And then you're just going to check them daily. So your first count to see if what the germination rate will be at day seven, second count at day 14, and then you're gonna count them. So you wanna see out of the 25 seeds you had on that wet paper towel, how many actually germinated. So in this case, 23 seeds seem to have germinated, um, two didn't, so that's a 92% uh, germination rate. That's pretty good. Uh, sometimes some of the seeds I buy from major seed companies that are supposed to be seed from the previous year have 50% germination rates, if I'm lucky. So that's really good for your own seed. <clears throat> and that's basically it. So I'm a few minutes over. Um, but that's kind of a, an intro to, uh, to seed saving. So here's a few resources for you. Uh, new Seed Starters Handbook, <clears throat> Seed Sowing and Saving, uh, Saving Our Seeds Project Guides, and a Seed Saving Guide for Gardeners and Farmers. I apologize. My throat is uh, not happy. And I did record this. So this will be posted on our YouTube channel, Metro Master Gardener. 
So if you want to go back and watch it again because you missed something or you sh showed up a little bit later, uh, you can definitely do that. I should have that up there sometime tomorrow. But other than that, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.